is a Metro Talk, an initiative by Metropolis, the World Association of the Major Metropolises, in collaboration with its partners. Okay, I, what we we're witnessing right now is that uh, the COVID-19 has uh, confronted us to certain problems that we already knew they were there in how we have been planning and how we have been designing uh, urban policies in our in our cities and especially in big cities and metropolitan areas and now we also we have i think has accelerated some of the processes and some of the issues that other, some of the debates that we already had no the issues about going green uh, the issues about smart city and the digital gap the issues about safety the issues about mobility and apparently it looks like that suddenly it's like we have the urgency to rethink what's going on, to rethink how we are shaping cities. And in some places we have realized that we left sometimes citizens behind. We were making these cities grow, sometimes without control, sometimes very, very fast. And at some point we realized that where are citizens standing here? Do they have a right to say, are we taking into account them when we are developing these, these, these cities, these metropolitan areas? Uh, we are realizing from Metropolis perspective is that, uh, well, governance is a key issue. And the problem is that metropolitan areas and major cities, they are complex. I mean, the process that we see in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, mostly, that they keep expanding all the time, these cities. How you can plan a city that is receiving people, inhabitants, dwellers on daily basis in thousands, in, in thousands, yet at the same time, it's growing unstoppably. That's one thing. And then the complexity is about interest. I mean, we realize that we have more and more complex societies where people have different identities within them. Like, well, you, it's, you can be male, female, but young, older. Uh, you can have a disability or no disability. You can be a migrant or migrant. You have, have, have different cultural, cultural backgrounds. And that means that one tailor-made solutions are impossible. But at the same time, you cannot do the same for everybody. And when you are designing this, the, your, your, your metropolitan area, you realize that now you have to take into account these realities. Uh, what I mean is that I have the feeling, and maybe Hellish knows better than me, that in the past was easier to plan a city, to design a city. Now, with all these ideas of intersectionality, you need to take into account many, many issues, not only the proper urban design, but also all issues related to environment, social impact, uh, and, and so on. And I think we have right now in a very, very interesting moment where we can open interesting discussions that can contribute to those people who are thinking, who are shaping the cities to already introduce the changes that are needed, needed that were already needed before the COVID-19. Well, first of all, Thanks a lot for, for the opportunity to have this conversation. I think it's in extremely timely uh, because in a rapid change situation that we are experiencing now, we have a fantastic opportunity to build back better and to, uh, to, to actually um, uh, learn from, from the rapid behavior change that is actually happening in communities globally right now. And to build on those learnings, uh, to actually implement and move closer to the idea of cities for people that I've been advocating for the past two decades. So in every crisis, in every moment of crisis, there is also an opportunity uh, to, to do better. And, uh, and, and that's why I think this conversation we are having today is incredibly timely. When it comes to public space and, and communities and people, um, that whole area is of course very, very controlled, you could say by municipal governments and uh, by people that are impacting local decisions. However, that whole field is also incredibly linked to uh, land use planning at a regional scale, uh, the way we design and develop our mobility systems, uh, even the way we develop our uh, behavior and food systems, 
um, the access that people have to, to health and education and so forth. I mean, there is a lot of the systems that we actually uh, develop and design at a regional, at a metropolitan scale that is in the end impacting uh, people's everyday lives and the way that we can behave and move around in our public spaces. And that's why I'm often referring to the fact that the quality of those regional planning decisions, we can only, only measure that quality at eye level from the individual experience in a public space. Um, I think we have uh, an, a number of opportunities to now rethink also the tools by which we are, are then moving into uh, to, 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 to this period of time where we can reimagine and rethink um, and, uh, and, and, and retool, so, so to speak. And, uh, and so, so, so that's maybe an opportunity for us to, to have a conversation today uh, about uh, what those tools, what those tools might be uh, right now. Uh, yeah, so, so thank you, Hella, so much for joining us. Um, uh, for the viewers, I, I'm Sam Kling, Global Cities Fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Um, shortly after the pandemic started, if we can go all the way back, uh, seems like a lifetime ago, uh, Gail launched a website um, called Public Space, Public Life, and COVID-19. Uh, and I was wondering if you could speak a little to why you felt it was important to create that website? Well, um, as soon as the pandemic actually happened, we felt that it was important to go out very, very quickly and, um, and survey what was in fact happening in the communities, both in Denmark, where we are based uh, with our, one of our offices, but also in fact globally engaging uh, our wider uh, network of followers so that we could really document uh, what, is, what is happening right now. Uh, because we have so much data in cities about uh, uh, economic performance or uh, transport numbers or, uh, or, or, or other, other, other types of, of data sets, but we don't actually have data available on how people are in fact um, behaving and, and using uh, their, their neighborhoods, their, their spaces, uh, streets and, and neighborhood squares and, and, and so forth. So, so we felt it was incredibly important to, uh, to make that type of data available for decision makers in this transformational time. Uh, so that we can be more aware of, of what, is, what is happening and respond to those changes appropriately. So in, incredibly interesting, I think one of the things that we found out, uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, a lot of the activity in the traditional downtown cores have dropped uh, immensely in the beginning of, of the crisis. Um, our traditional retail cores had very low activity, but surprisingly, neighborhoods were more active, much more active than they, they used to be. And uh, in the surveys that we have kept doing over the last uh, half year now, we see that that activity level uh, locally in neighborhoods are remaining high. And, uh, and, and so, so we are seeing a, a response, uh, a sort of a revival of the neighborhoods, uh, a localism, you might call it, where, where people are obviously working more from home. They are um, outdoors uh, meeting others because we are physically distancing, but we are not necessarily socially distancing because we care. We care about the neighborhood that we are in. We care about the businesses, the local businesses, um, the, the, the associations and, and so forth of which that we are a part. And, uh, and we've seen a, a lot of people actually take local actions in a way that we uh, perhaps thought were long gone. Uh, 
um, and, um, and, and, and that might move us towards thinking differently about our metropolitan areas where the neighborhood districts are becoming actually more vital, more mixed, uh, where we can cater for more services locally. And, and then we also obviously have to rethink our urban cores because they need to be able to do more than just offer retail and, and culture. Um, they, they in themselves have to also be more complete neighborhoods. I, I think you said two, two things very, well, three things. Well, I have two, two reactions and, and one question. What you said. It's interesting what you said about the data, that we had a lot of economic and financial data about cities but not really uh, data at, at other levels. In fact, uh, we have the experience in Metropolis that we have the Metropolis Observatory, and we developed a project with the London School of Economics because we wanted to have comparative data of our membership from all around the world uh, in a sets of data, uh, indicators on social indicators, environmental indicators, uh, gender indicators, governance indicators, and economic. Economic indicators was very easy to find, but in many, many cities, even in cities, you would say that maybe it's uh, cities in the global south that they don't have the data, but even cities in the global north, they don't have sometimes consolidated data about social issues. So that's, I think, one of the challenges, how we really produce data and data that can, can be managed by the, the city. Because sometimes through that as well, the private sector has data, but the, 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 the local government doesn't know how to relate to the, to the private sector to handle this data. Uh, that's one thing. Then the other thing you said about public space. Uh, yeah, it, uh, we have realized that public space was important, no? Because it's where life is taking place. We we'll have we see the experiences, for example, in New York, where pub, everything now is promoting that things take place in the public space, no? Uh, and when they have moved cars in some streets, that then restaurants can move the tables outside on the street, or here as well, markets in, in etc. Et uh, so I think uh, I was just saying. We, do you think, that's my two questions, on the one hand, do you think that are we going to change the way that we shape and think the, metro, the spaces, the public space? And the other part is about, uh, I have the feeling that for a period of time uh, in the metropolitan areas, we're talking about polycentric metropolitan areas. But polycentric metropolitan areas understood as in one part of the metropoli metropolitan area, you have hospitals, in another you have the educational district, in another half you have the leisure, in another another place you have the 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 the, 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 the houses and where people live. Uh, what you were saying is that what we're going to see is that we have a polycentric metropolitan area, but these polycentric uh, spaces will have everything within them or not. Is that what you, you foresee? I know it's not easy, but... Um, I'm definitely foreseeing that we need more complete neighborhoods. Um, uh, and by complete neighborhoods, I mean housing and working and, and, and uh, shops and, um, you know, sports and culture and everything mixed uh, more locally. Maybe certain functions, as you mentioned, uh, hospitals uh, still need to be uh, you know, centralized in, in to, to some extent in order to actually provide all the areas of expertise that we need. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but certainly, I, I think we need to move towards uh, a, a more sustainable way of developing where, where we have the services available more locally where, where we need them. Uh, in that way, we can also reduce our need for traveling so to give you an example, um, another area that has changed a lot is, uh, is of course, transportation and the fact that we are now working from home. Uh, many, many of the big corporations uh, in, in the cities that we have surveyed uh, are, are 20 to 50% to below their normal capacity in the big offices. So let's imagine that you don't need to uh, have all your employees go into a centralized office, uh, but you might actually end up with small branches uh, where you have local areas where people can actually 
more easily commute by foot or by bicycle to a place where they can collaborate with colleagues. Uh, they might not actually work in the same department, but they can still uh, collaborate and be part of a company organization. And then sometimes only you still need to go to the headquarters. Uh, those are the types of changes that I that I'm imagining that we might see uh, as we look into the to the future. Um, besides, you know, some offices might just continue working completely from home, uh, but 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 this change is actually now impacting uh, our transportation systems. Uh, public transportation systems are significantly lower. Uh, you know, less used right now compared to earlier. And we see many more people that are biking and, and walking and choosing active transportation in that way or low carbon uh, systems, you could also call it. Uh, and it's a free choice. I mean, they're doing it because it makes sense for them. It's, it's, they feel they are healthier by making that choice. Um, and the surveys that, that we have done, people, want to, you know, 60% of the people that are now working from home, they want to continue working from home or at least have the flexibility to choose to do so. 20% um, of the people that are now biking, they would like to continue biking if the infrastructure allows them to continue to do so. So we are seeing some massive behavior changes uh, that we had only dreamt were possible and they have happened over a very, very short time. Now, the question is, what are we doing in terms of making sure that those choices that people have made that are in fact healthy, both for, them, for themselves, for the communities that they are a part of, for the environment, that those choices can actually be sustained moving forward. And that is gonna require you know, big discussions, new strategies, uh, both in companies, in municipal governments, uh, in transport, in the transport sector, uh, etc. So building off of that point, you're alluding to the decision making process and and political leadership. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little to your experiences working with cities right now. And if you've seen a greater willingness to experiment with public space. And uh, on the other hand, how you balance, you know, this need to, to react quickly and respond to the needs of the moment with the need also to engage with the citizens and to uh, uh, create policies that reflect the will of people who live in neighborhoods. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I think, uh, there is an incredible amount of, um, of, of action happening right now uh, in, in many cities around the world. Temporary bike infrastructure, uh, temporary street closures for restaurants and shops to display things outdoors, have, have more outdoor activities, um, uh, reimagining ways that, that, that we can engage and uh, survey and understand people's needs by using various platforms, um, so so I'm I'm actually quite uh, quite happy to see all that prototyping and, and and rapid testing that that is basically happening due to the needs uh, in in the communities. Um, that cannot stand alone. It has it has to be combined with long term planning, long term strategizing. Uh, uh, thinking about, you know, the UN sustainability goals and, you know, the, the, the big picture um, uh, uh, as well. So, but combining the two by thinking long term and then applying rapid prototyping, we can actually quickly, I think, move uh, in the right direction. And, and that is a completely new planning paradigm. Because earlier, we thought we could we could engage and then we could make a strategy and then we could deploy the strategy and make plans and then we could define projects and then we could build the project and and it was just a, a much more sort of linear way of thinking about planning and cities what is happening right now is not linear it's 
it's it's much more you know it, it requires much more engaged politicians it requires the ability to listen to what emerges it acqu it acquires the uh, the uh, willingness to test and to use data to support by using evidence and and, and then scale up what is actually working uh, and then develop your programs and your and your plans based on what you're learning so so it's actually more of an of an um, upside down or bottom up combined with some top down thinking it it is a completely new paradigm and i don't know whether our politicians right now and our governance systems right now is actually really tuned into that uh, because i on the other hand and, and unfortunately, I also see some places a kind of paralyzed decision maker process where, where our politicians, they, in some ways, they've been quick and they've been, you know, quick at, at, at offering compensation packages and supporting local businesses and what have you. But, but these basic new ways of working, essentially, and new ways of, of coming together listening, uh, discussing, making sense, uh, moving forward, that type of decision making process is, uh, is new. And, and I find it difficult to, to implement something like that when it's at the same time happening virtually. Uh, so so we, are, we are a little bit um, in a situation right right now where where we need our decision makers to 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 take stock of what is happening and to actually then uh, change their approach to leadership and um, and and that's not done overnight. It's something that I think we need to uh, work on for the next uh, few years uh, in order to benefit from this uh, period that we are in right now. I, I would like you to, to go more in depth in what you are saying, because this, I think, is, 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 is one of the critical issues uh, from my point of view. But um, I'm, I don't know if I will, will explain properly, but my feeling is that, on the one hand, we will have more and more emergencies will be arising more often, more frequently, all around the world, uh, natural disasters, pandemics, uh, whatever. And it means that, on the one hand, local leaderships uh, local leadership needs to, take, needs, needs to take quickly decisions, no? to react to the urgency. And you said all these changes in public space that were introduced very quickly uh, by means of the tactical urbanism, which doesn't need a lot of financial investment. But at the same time, you are talking about a new way of doing things, which are complex. This is very complex. It's a new approach. It's starting to incorporate, as you say, different actors. It means you were saying, if I properly understood that uh, our political leadership Need to, have, need to have new approaches, new, new focus, new ways of doing things. And, and this then takes longer term. I mean, it's, it's, this complex process takes longer than having quick decisions. So now, how is this? Is how we can handle this idea on sometimes need to react very, very quickly, but not losing sight of the long term and the complexity of this process that you, you are proposing on how to, to think the, the city. And the other one is about how we can finance all the transformations. Because I said before, of course, with tactical urbanism, you can do quick interventions, uh, cheap in the sense of that you don't you don't spend quite a lot of money. But in the transformations that you are talking about, we need to really do structural transformations of the city in the long term, and that costs a lot of money. And local governments they don't have this money. So how how do you see all that? Well, I think we need to work more holistically. I mean, uh, we now have we now understand that health is something very basic when it comes to planning um, and, and uh, so so health equity and sustainability goes hand in hand we need to approach uh, planning and development uh, of our cities in a more holistic way and uh, and and rather than having fixed plans we need to act we need to um, we need to do we, we need to sort of act planning. <laughs> Rather than having fixed strategies, we need to strategize. Um, so, so that means having maybe more of a framework plan and then uh, test 
uh, by doing one project at a time and, and do sort of more incremental uh, development, so to speak, and then use data. And, and, and I always promote the public life data because that gives you the lens of the end user, the citizens, the customer, uh, you know, how does the, how, how does the city actually, how is it experienced from eye level? And then using that, that data to support your, your scaling up of the, of the various elements of a, of a plan or a framework. I think we might also need new types of plans. We might need um, uh, healthy neighborhood plans. We might need, uh, you know, public realm uh, plans and strategies that are more all encompassing rather than just having a mobility strategy or, or make one public space or street at a time. So we might actually need to implement uh, completely new, uh, new ways of, uh, of, of, of approaching a neighborhood plan. When it comes to financing, uh, this is interesting because uh, I think every municipality around the world is, uh, is lacking financing. Uh, so, so we need to form new partnerships. Um, utility companies can go together with, uh, with the municipalities when it comes to uh, climate adaptation, for example, so that we really, uh, whenever we have to uh, rethink or redesign or redo utilities in a street and, and apply uh, uh, you know, more, more climate adaptation, we can at the same time make sure that we engage the community. We think about equity and inclusion. Uh, we think about the, the, the programming uh, of that design so that it's not just rebuilt, but it's built back better to support equity, inclusion, uh, gender equality, and, and so forth in that neighborhood. So partnering between uh, different types of organizations, private and pub public sector, uh, organizations it is incredibly important. I think also we'll see more investments from large pension funds uh, because we we can actually see that some of the infrastructure that I'm promoting uh, is actually um, has a has a really good return on investment because people become healthier by being able to bicycle on an everyday basis by having access to public space where you can meet your fellow citizens and uh, your neighbors and uh, develop friendships. Uh, we can actually reduce loneliness. We can reduce um, uh, obesity and other health risks in our society. So, so I, I think we will see more large pension funds move into uh, infrastructure development, public space development, uh, bicycle bridges, and, and so forth. And then I think uh, philanthropy has um, a special role uh, where they can actually help de-risk uh, certain moves by helping the public sector uh, engage uh, or make a new plan or test a new healthy community plan or something like that, which a city might not have experienced with before. Uh, but then the phil philanthropic sector can maybe come in and help de-risk the testing of a new tool or the testing of a new uh, building uh, method or engagement method. Um, and in that way, overcome some of the barriers there are in public sector in terms of trying new things and being innovative. Uh, and of course, uh, philanthropy doesn't have the muscles to go in and take upon them uh, huge uh, infrastructure development costs, but certainly they can take some of the um, testing and the prototyping and the, uh, and the sort of de-risking of the early stages of, uh, of strategizing engagement and planning. Uh, and I see a, a huge potential there for, for closer collaboration also with that sector. So those are just some of the ideas uh, that, that I have in terms of uh, financing of, uh, of, of those uh, types of, of developments that, that we'll see. So when it comes to cities actually um, implementing changes, have you seen any specific examples of places that have really embraced the moment 
and implemented some of these strategies that you're talking about, whether it's financing or uh, you know, quick build outs of new infrastructure and engaging with the community and are, are really doing it right that other cities should look to? I think many cities are actually doing uh, a lot of things right now, and it's it's difficult to just point to one or two, uh, uh, you know, cities like like Paris and Bogota uh, have done uh, an incredibly uh, amount of stuff in, in in terms of bicycling and 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 quick infrastructure. You know, a small city like Mountain View uh, in, in in California has been. Um, Testing open streets and and out, outdoor dining and uh, uh, and and engaging communities in different ways. Um, we are working with uh, with also uh, Curative in the U.S. Uh, a health uh, and test provider to provide a kiosk uh, for self testing that can be available in public spaces to marginalized communities. Uh, so that the people who cannot afford a car and would otherwise maybe be outside of the healthcare system uh, have access to being tested and, um, and, and can take care of their family and, and, and close uh, connections in that way. Uh, and that's also another type of, of, of action um, which is related to public space where the public space is being used as a connecting tissue, you could say, uh, connecting all the way out uh, to everyone in the community. Um, we are also seeing um, uh, other cities uh, uh, doing things in, in, uh, in the food area where they are taking uh, uh, to sort of the seizing the moment by, by now also debating how can we actually change people's uh, uh, food diets so that we are staying within our planetary boundaries. Um, and and uh, uh, and actually benefit from the fact that that young people right now are more physically active and uh, and more aware of their health risks um, associated with their everyday urban living and so forth. There there's so many great examples. Um, I I also think that you know cities like uh, Copenhagen where I live um, have proven to be fairly robust and resilient actually, because um, cities that have a great diverse uh, network of public spaces that allows every single citizen to have access to green space and have access to active mobility networks, um, waterfronts, uh, public harbor baths, um, you know, that, that, that type of city uh, with that amount of, of, of public space and infrastructure have proven to be incredibly resilient because people, um, people have had access to that incredible resource uh, during the pandemic when everybody was, uh, when everything was locked down, everyone felt the, the physical need and the mental need to be, to be outdoors and have access to that healthy, clean air, green space um, and, uh, and, and, and Copenhagen is not the only city that has that type of, of long-term view on public space and infrastructure. So, so we need more cities to be like Copenhagen and to be green and to have high quality networks in public spaces because we can see in a moment like this, it is incredible how resilient uh, the, the, the city as a physical form has been. Now, we shouldn't rest of our laurels here because uh, we, we can also see that some of those cities have also maybe become slightly more lazy in a way because they haven't had the same need to come up with quick uh, interim solutions uh, because they haven't basically had the same problems. Uh, because the infrastructure was already there. Uh, so, so we are having interesting dialogues with a couple of those cities that, that are maybe have been front runners for a while in terms of, you know, what is it that they then need to, to lead on uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to learn from this crisis and, and again, 
build back better, uh, even in even from coming from good to great, uh, you could say. So, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Helis Sohol, CEO of, of, of Geld. I think you have provided us with lots of food for thought, but mainly you've been, you have given a lot of ideas, proposals, approaches, and methodology that will be very helpful to rethink our metropolitan spaces. And as well, thank you for you are the first one who has started with our Metro Talks that we have joined forces today together with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs on this Metro Talk. And thank you because it's been very, very useful. I don't know, Samuel, from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, if you want to add something else. Uh, I think, you know, agreed this was a, a terrific conversation. Um, I, I hope that viewers' minds are, are piqued and that, uh, you know, so many of these ideas and, and, and thoughts uh, can maybe lead to uh, new approaches in this moment of crisis and opportunity. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I mention uh, a, a framework that I don't know if, if, if this was sort of the wrap up, but I just wanted to maybe mention, I forgot to mention sort of a, a framework that might be helpful because right now in the US, uh, Sam, this is maybe especially for you, uh, your interest that in the US we are implementing uh, a framework that we call inclusive healthy places. And um, this is a framework developed with support by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation a couple of years ago. And um, just when the pandemic started in the beginning of uh, spring this year, we uh, got further support from the foundation to help uh, scale up the use of this framework across various organizations in the US, uh, including the American Planning Association. Uh, so we are now in a, in a, in a long-term process where we are helping other organizations to implement a healthy places, inclusive healthy places framework uh, to think more holistically about equity and health uh, and inclusion in, in relationship with uh, public space uh, planning and development uh, so that we can have more sustainable uh, communities and cities moving forward. And I, I hope this framework um, can, can be institutionalized in some way in different in, in different uh, in a different uh, form obviously for various organizations but uh, uh, but but that uh, work is is ongoing right now and uh, and again it's I think very timely uh, to to be uh, working with this particular framework at this moment of time thank you I, I think we can finish with one sentence set now we want to build inclusive healthy spaces and I would say inclusive, healthy metropolitan area, metropolitan spaces. So thank you, thank you very much for this Metro Talk.